Hello, my name is Sandra Perrone. I'm Professor of Arts and Humanities here at Springfield Technical Community College and Gallery Coordinator of the Amy H. Carberry Fine Arts Gallery located in Building 28. The Carberry Gallery strives to foster intellectual engagement and dialogue beyond the traditional classroom by breaking preconceived notions of a gallery as an exclusive space. One function of the gallery is to share who artists and photographers are and what they create and to inspire students to pursue their creative endeavors and career goals. Fine arts courses are open to everyone here at STCC, and the importance of visual literacy to every student's overall educational experience cannot be understated, no matter their major. I originally conceived of this, these virtual Carberry Conversation interviews in response to the pandemic and life on Zoom back in the fall of 2020. Each interview covers a wide variety of topics, including origin stories, impact of current events on artistic process, and the function of art and photography. I continue to offer this virtual format to keep gallery programming fully accessible to everyone, while creating an archive of these conversations available on YouTube as a community resource. Today, it is my honor and privilege to speak with Leverett photographer and educator, James Garrett. His exhibition, A Simple Circle, is on view at the Carberry Gallery on the campus of STCC through April 12th. James Garrett is an artist and educator with over 30 years of experience creating images and studying photography. He holds a BFA in photography from Savannah College of Art and a master's in library and information science from Simmons University and has lectured on photography at a variety of institutions, including Mount Holyoke College, Simmons University, and the Holyoke Public Library. In 2022, Garrett published a collection in the form of four quarterly reviews of his photographic work called From Where I'm Standing. Welcome, James, to Carberry Conversations, and thank you so much for sharing mm -hmm. your wonderful work. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity. Uh, it's just really a pleasure to um, to kind of share what I've been working on for the past four years and have it in this this forum. So um, it's been really great working with you and and stick. And uh, thanks for the platform. It's been amazing. I have to say this um, this show before I dive into into questions, because I have lots of questions. And as a fellow photographer, um, I want to I want to just be completely transparent you and I met briefly. I have a very brief memory of meeting you in the late nineties mm -hmm. when we were, we, our paths crossed like most photographers in the Valley do at some point. Um, you and I worked for some of the same commercial shooters in the late nineties. Um, Eric Pogenpole, uh, mm -hmm as one one commercial shooter that I know he was in the room. He introduced me to you and also uh, Jim Guype. So, but then I didn't see you see or hear of you again until <laughs> right. until like a year ago or two two years ago. So it's wonderful that that like things came full circle. And it's interesting that neither of us went the commercial photography route. <laughs> <laughs> Where a lot of I think a lot of assistants go that way, and they they learn a lot mm -hmm. from those photographers, and then bring yeah. out their own work. But yeah, 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 that's another story. Yes. <laughs> well, this is um, this is the show. So we're going to just start walking people through the show. Um, this picture is as you walk into the main mm -hmm. entrance of the gallery in Building Twenty Eight. As I said, um, it's a thousand square foot space, and you've uh, laid it out so beautifully um, with display cases that hold the vintage work um, from the late eighteen hundreds, eighteen nineties. And juxtapose that with your contemporary work, which is the larger work that's seen on the wall um, that you can actually pick up. It's just a little, we created these little shelves and the work isn't affixed to the wall as much as it's just sort of leaning there just ever so gently. Um, and, and throughout this um, exhibition, um, that juxtaposition is one of the really interesting things about this particular um, show. But I want to start by asking you, when did you first pick up a camera? That's a great question. Uh, and and I, um, I think about it in different ways um, because I don't associate photography completely with a camera. 
um, because I feel like uh, I see the world in a way, and I've been taking pictures without a camera before I knew what photography was. You know, I was a kid in the the outfield that was looking up at the clouds and not doing the sports, you know? And um, I remember riding in the back of my parents' car and looking at the telephone lines out the back seat and looking at shapes and forms. And then once I discovered photography, I was able to capture those observations and then be able to look at them again. So it's really kind of a self-service uh, process of um, collecting observations, collecting, you know, just even on the way to work today of uh, looking at a stop sign and how it was juxtaposed against the car in front of me and, and making those kind of visual games is just a, a way I operate. Um, but to get to your question about actually the first time I picked up a camera, um, I was with my dad. We were... Um, chopping wood in the winter and we went to I grew up in Wisconsin small rural town we we're cutting wood and we went to a tavern for a lunch break and I won a hundred dollars in the bottom of a Mountain Dew can it was like some competition and I, I thought oh, what do I do with a hundred dollars is 1985 84 and I almost bought a turntable so maybe I could have been a DJ but I ended up buying a camera and um, and was able to start being creative with it at that point. So uh, and really from that point on, I've always had a camera within hand's reach and uh, and it's, it's been a part of my life, part of who I am. Mm -hmm. So when you think back to your trajectory as a photographer, OK, so it's been a while, you know, if you think about the 80s. OK, yes. Um, who are some of the people who influenced you growing up or growing as a photographer? You know, did you find mentors in college? Did you find mentorship or other um, work that you just were really interested that you followed or like, how did you learn the craft of photography? Yeah, it was really in the beginning, it was self-discovery. Uh, I, um, I've always been interested in technology, uh, experimenting with things. I turned my parents' basement bathroom into a makeshift dark room. I had like a, a coffee table on the shower and, and you know, and like I had a hose running to it. Um, a, a friend's dad gave me their old and larger, knew, knowing that I was into photography, um, and then took a high school class. Uh, I really didn't know what I was going to do with my life. And I went to a community college. So kudos to um, Stick. I love community colleges. They they gave me a direction. I, I took a communications class um, and I learned about, uh, I had to write a paper. And I learned about a photographer named Paul Strand. And, um, and when I saw his work, this light bulb went off that showed me that someone else looked at the world as I did, saw the shapes, the light, the lines, these, these quiet moments that uh, I was thinking about and trying to capture. I knew of like um, uh, Ansel Adams' work and the, the grand vistas and the dramaticness of those images, which I wasn't drawn to. Um, and so Strand really spoke to me. And I realized, and I didn't grow up in a family that went to art shows or knew anything about art. And I didn't even know what like a photography career would be. So after being in community college, I, I did that for a couple of years or maybe a year and a half. And then I, I discovered uh, the Savannah College of Art and Design program. Worked with uh, an amazing photographer, uh, Craig Stevens. Um, and he, uh, through working at that program, I learned about uh, the history of photography and I love technology and working with processes. So I really got into printing. Uh, mm -hmm. So printing was my, my hook. I think then um, after graduating, I worked in um, uh, camera shops. So I met all the local photographers. That's how I met Jim Guype and Eric Pogan Paul and, uh, mm -hmm. I started printing for photographers like Bill Arnold, who had a great influence on me as well. Mm -hmm. After that, I um, I got a job working at a conservation photo lab in the Berkshires called the Chicago Albumen Works, where we got to print and work on negative duplication for museums. And so uh, working with Doug Munson taught me the techni technical ability of, um, of photography. So... Mm -hmm. I think those were the major influences on on um, my work is, is uh, I don't know, as, as far as um, learning technique and 
seen those people. So yeah. Yeah. Well, I'm just I'm scrolling through here. Just um, some of these exhibition views are some mm -hmm. of what people will find if they are able to get to the gallery by April 12th. Um, and so we should talk a little bit about this <laughs> vintage technology versus uh, yeah. contemporary photography. Um, you know, you have these beautiful display cases with the vitrine, you know, over it to obviously protect it because this is original work from the 1880s, 1890s. Um, and I'm just juxtaposing this with, with a close up of one of these, they're about four inches by five inches, right? Roughly. Um, but I wanted people to appreciate like that. They're not that big, no. that circle, mm -hmm. um, because all of the images in the show are a circle. Yes. Um, and that that circle is not that big. So you have some magnifying glasses as you go through the show, you can actually like magnify what is happening, you know, what is in that little circle. But can you talk about the importance of the circle to this work? Uh, it's really interesting. Uh, so I mentioned how I'm interested in the history of photography and cameras. I've, I've loved equipment and cameras and, um, and I've played around with adding funky old lenses on different equipment. And I've have, I have eight by 10 view cameras and I would put like a, uh, an older lens on that view camera. And so all lenses, you, people don't really realize this, but all lenses project a circle. Uh, and it's just the shape of the lens. And what happens is either the film or the sensor crop it down to the shape that we want. Uh, so when I put a smaller lens on a larger format, that's how I got the circular image. So I started thinking about how do I create that in a modern way? Um, Eastman was doing it originally because, so you have to keep in mind, these are uh, contact prints. So the size of the picture is the size of the negative. And to um, take the most advantage of that film size, George Eastman thought, well, let's make it the full size of the image. And they created a, a circular mask that cropped off some of the fall off. Mm -hmm. But that's why that circle came yeah. Historically, there has been other circular images. The first um, uh, picture on glass by uh, Sir John Herschel was uh, a circular image in 18, I don't know, 39, I think, or something like that. Um, and so I started looking at uh, circu circular images. Um, I found the first one of these cards in an antique store. And I think it was in the background of that one shot of uh, St. Bernard, mm -hmm. uh, which really got me into thinking, how do I uh, create these objects in a modern version. And I really wanted to um, focus on the object. So I love these items as objects, the history of how um, they were posted on someone's wall. You know, there'd be a thumbtack in it. There's there's bangs and dings. And, and that's just kind of a sign that these were really objects that were loved and held and brought through with the people through their lives. So I wanted to create a modern version of that, that you were able to hold and be a part of that object. So um, I gilded the edges. I kind of recreated the same format. I, I did the same backing material uh, and, and created this enlarged handheld version of uh, the cabinet card. And the cabinet card evolved over time. They, were, they weren't in frames. They weren't in ab albums. They were placed on people's cabinets and they were, you know, set up to view as you came in. They were kind of an early social media. People would trade them, hand them out, and give them to each other as like calling cards. Um, but that doesn't get into the ubiquity of photography, if you want to go into that discussion. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> it's the um, next, it's the next level, James. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I mean, if you think about today, we really use photography as uh, communication. It's, it is in itself a language. I'll go to the grocery store and I'll take a picture of something and I'll send it to my wife and say, you know, and, and I'll just put a question mark and yeah. that'll be, we do you want this for dinner. And, and we will be communicating through pictures and we can send that instantaneously around the world, which um, I think is amazing. Yeah. And how do we get to that point of so uh, much, um, ubiquity of photography that it started with George Eastman. Um, prior to 1888, it, you had to use a large plate view camera. Uh, mm -hmm. There were some inventions that came along, but you had to, uh, you had to know chemistry or you had to go to a studio. 
So we have no real pictures of the common person's life uh, that just wasn't captured. You had to either be you know, a hobbyist or a professional to get these images. Mm -hmm. Eastman comes up with this uh, roll film. In the, in, in the beginning, it was paper. It was a paper film uh, that uh, gave 100 pictures. And you could just buy the box and then it had 100 shots available. You send it back. They give you the prints and then, um, and so the quality wasn't very good in the beginning. Mm -hmm. Gelatin comes along, gives us a plastic emulsion that allows us to get uh, more clear, transparent negatives and a better resolution. In the beginning, they were very expensive. So it's kind of upper middle class. It was $100 for this box, which I just looked up in today's money would be like $3,000. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't. Not everybody was doing it yet, but it was the very beginning. Um, you know, like if you look at today's um, Apple VR set, you know, I feel like that's way too expensive. <laughs> Maybe in five, 10 years, I might have one. I don't know. But yeah. Um, yeah. So well, that's we're working with the, the slide that's up right now is an old ad for the Kodak yeah. camera, right? And their slogan you press the button, we do the rest. Right. And, and so the only camera that anybody can use without instructions. <laughs> <laughs> I loved that part. Like it's the only camera that you can use without instructions, which would have been true. And and obviously the price came down because yeah. um, uh, on this particular ad, uh, the price was twenty five dollars loaded for 100 pictures. Reloading was only two. Yeah. 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 So we start seeing pictures of people's babies and dogs and vacations and mm -hmm. houses um, and start seeing into their lives. Yeah. So we have a few of these cameras on display um, that so people can appreciate the um, the size. Right. Because mm -hmm. it's not a huge camera. Yeah. The first one and, and actually that black one is a, a 1988 um, 100 year anniversary reproduction of it. It's not actually a working camera, uh, but it, it's the same exact size. Uh, the second one, uh, so that those are the smaller circles. Uh, and then the second one is the number two. I think it came out in 1889 or 1890. Um, and that has a larger negative surface. So it, we got bigger prints. It actually has a viewfinder in it. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, you can see the, the, the box after that second one, the wooden one is the insides of it. So you can see the mask. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And then that last one is when we get into the early 1900s with um, really kind of a vest pocket photo camera that um, gives complete portability. And mm -hmm, mm -hmm. yeah, let's look at, uh, well, here, here's a nice juxtaposition. I put this in because I wanted people to be able to appreciate like the size of yours, <laughs> you know, <laughs> Are, are significantly bigger, right? Um, but but the that that the other ones are small and portable, and like you said, like people would collect them because they're like they're on a little bit of a cardboard. It's not like a thin sheet of paper. It's it's actually like card, almost like a cardstock, right? Yes. Yep. Yeah. And um, as you said, as we start to look at some of them up close, this one is. Um, horse-drawn carriage with seated driver. Um, but for all of these, I think, right, we don't know any of the photographers. Is that correct? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Um, why is that? Why do we not know? You know, I think it's, um, you know, if you go to a junk store or a flea market and you see a family photo album, and I always look at these albums and these objects and go, oh my God, how could somebody get, get rid of these? Why, who, why wouldn't someone else pick this up in that family and carry on where it came from? But yeah. we really don't know, you know, if we look at our family photo albums, if, if it's taken away from that context, it's now just informational value, what's in the object. It's no longer about why the picture was taken, who took the picture. Uh, it now tells us, oh, look at, there's these kind of carriages at that time period. Look at the architecture. We can we can learn a lot about other objects, or other parts of the object, then, and the photographer really does get lost to um, history. Right, right. 
And that's true because without knowing who it is, we don't know where it is. For this, for almost many of them, we don't know it. There's a few where someone's actually written something on the back. Right. Like it might say uh, Tolland, Connecticut, mm -hmm. 1891 or so, but that's it. Yep. That's and and that's like a lot of information <laughs> for most for most of them. As I was looking through the show, right. they, there's, there's no additional or in the rare case, there's something recognizable. But we'll we'll see more of those examples. But I thought this was an interesting one to start with because there is a person in it. They're wearing a certain kind of garb. Mm -hmm. um, it's a, it's it's a a carriage that has two horses, right? So it must have been a bigger carriage. You can't see all of the carriage in this shot. Right. And as you said, the architecture immediately behind um, this this sort of cropped. We only see the back end of the horse and the front end of the carriage. <laughs> with the but but who was this person and why did somebody take this picture? Right, exactly. That, that's well, another interesting question. And the also the great thing is we're starting to see capture of motion too. So we we can have a, a photograph of something moving where before it was just a very still. Uh, exposure for like you would have to sit for a minute 30 seconds more yeah. or uh, we're getting more spontaneous photography at that point right right here's another interesting one in the collection you said this one is kind of rare yeah um this one it's it's definitely um has a little bit of damage i don't know it's like kind of scuffed a little bit or discolored but it's from the same same era mm -hmm. um photographer unknown um uh, three african-american children and and I was asking you about the date and you said, oh, my God, this would have been like just 23 years, maybe 25 years um, after uh, the Civil War, after the U.S. Civil War or mm -hmm. after um, uh, slavery. Um, yeah. So it, it has a lot of historical significance on a number of levels. Do you want to talk a little bit about that? Yeah, and, and that's something I, I talk to my students about of, of when we're reading a photograph. We're looking at the photograph in the now, uh, and and we're bringing to the photographer to the image um, our biases, our life history, and we're not um, we're not in that time period of of when the picture was taken, obviously. Um, but so there there are three people involved in every picture that contains a, a person. Uh, there's the photographer. There's the subject. And there's the viewer. So when we're looking at it, we need to think about who we are, what our life is, and not make any um, uh, assumptions about the people in it uh, and try to um, break down the clues of why the picture was taken. Uh, try to put ourselves in the place of the subjects. Uh, what was it like for them there? You know, if uh, slavery was abolished in 1865, were their parents? possibly slaves um and and what does this brand new technology mean to them did they know what was happening you know was this a picture that um that they would have seen then later uh, right. who the photographer was so there, it raises so many questions that um as an archivist you want to start looking into uh and and follow up on some of those leads kind of like a detective um mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's there's so many different avenues of uh, just society wise in this one photograph of uh, what it was like to be an African American child in 1888. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, another one. <laughs> this one makes me laugh. Yes, this and I, I have this one blown up in the gallery because uh, and it's on a um, on the screen in the back wall, part of the little movie that we we put up. Um, one thing I love look, reading photographs and, and just kind of looking at uh, what I was just talking about, putting yourself in the position of why the picture was taken. And I wish we had a close up of this, but it's it's like a, a young father and uh, a, I assume, so I'm making an assumption, uh, and a little <laughs> girl. Uh, and on this stump is a doll and the doll doesn't have a head. Uh, <laughs> And it's sitting up and the and the the gentleman's kind of pointing at the camera. He's got this kind of smirk on his face and the girl doesn't really look sad. But, you know, I, I, a story just starts coming up in my head like this girl's doll got broken and she's very upset. And then maybe to help her, he decides to take this picture. Uh, mm -hmm. I don't know. Uh, but 
I love finding these little treasures like this of kind of obscurity of why a picture was taken and what that what that tells us now. And how long have you been collecting this kind of work, the the, the vintage work? Yeah, I, you know, it's it's been a long time, uh, probably for over the last ten years. I think once eBay came along, it's been mm -hmm. it, it knows what I like and. <laughs> I've met other uh, photography dealers, so they know what I like. And so I've kind of built this reputation as collecting circular images and um, and and they they've grown over time. But I also really like um, early newspaper clippings uh, from like the early 1800s of when photography was announced. Um, and looking at it as a new technology, how people were reacting to it at the time. Um, the Harper's Weekly magazine from the eight, um, 1800s prior to Eastman's has some great comics about photography. Uh, and I'll bring some to the opening uh, that kind of show uh, the frustrations of photography at the time. And um, so it's been uh, just gradual. And I've I've always been interested in history and collecting. Um, so I think it's just kind of merge of those two. Mm -hmm. uh, so. Mm -hmm. so let's talk a little bit about your work um, and your response to these older images, because I feel like I'm assuming now, see, I'm, I might be assuming wrong, but like you saw these, these older versions before you decided to make your own circles. Is that true? Yeah. When, yeah. did you, when did you actually make that connection? You're like, I could make that. Right. And why would you make something that was already made in 1888? <laughs> yeah, uh, I think it's, it's really kind of a marriage of my interest in history and archives uh, and my photography. Uh, I love these individual objects and I wanted to create my own objects. I didn't want to have kind of the precious behind the glass object um, and, and something that was more meant to be held and um, looked at. Uh, so how to create that? I, I was just, um, like I said, I, I, I like tinkering with uh, old cameras and lenses. And uh, that being said, I also love digital photography and I love technology going forward. So I'm always looking at ways to combine those two. Um, and so what I did is I thought of Okay, the ease of digital, uh, I have a full frame sensor camera, a Sony camera, and I thought, well, what kind of lens would project a small circle on a full frame sensor? And I don't know if you can see it, but this is a, um, a 16 millimeter Wallensack uh, film movie camera lens that was designed, if you think of 16 millimeter, just a tiny little piece of film. So the circle didn't have to be very big, but you could have a good quality lens that was projecting um, a small circle. I then put that lens on an adapter and put it on my, my uh, digital camera and it projected a perfect circle onto the sensor. Um, and that after that, I wanted to, I, I uh, as much as I like technology, I never liked inkjet printing uh i think it's they're beautiful when people can do them themselves but it's just was the, it's the most expensive liquid in the world and if you don't use it every day the the printers jam up and you have to then flush the heads and it was just a complete pain mm -hmm. i love silver printing and historic processes so i was thinking how do i get these digital images onto silver traditional black and white paper um and I was looking at my uh, iMac monitor and I was like, wow, I can't even see the dots on this monitor unless I put a loop to it. So I got out my eight by 10 view camera. I inverted the, the image into a negative on the screen. So what you're seeing on the wall right now would be inverted black and white negative. I then put a piece of uh, eight by 10 paper, photographic paper into the back of the eight by 10 camera and I'm photographing my monitor, mm -hmm. uh, which uh, was just kind of an experiment to see if that would work. Um, I played around with contact printing on the monitor, but there's just a, a little separation. So I, I wasn't getting sharp images. Um, and, and then I just take that paper out and I put it into my chemistry and um, I can print right at home. Um, 
And I, I, uh, close up. This is, a, this is a close up one. Yeah. Yeah. This is one of your, one of your pieces. This is a, a, a Ilford warm tone fiber based paper that's then uh, selenium toned. So the, the warm tone paper really picks up kind of that eggplant purpley color that is similar to the um, 1888 uh, printing out process. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So what we're looking at, though, what, what's actually depicted in this picture, where where are you? <laughs> Where did you uh, see the head of a statue like this? <laughs> yeah, this is a, my son was working at, um, the name is escaping me. It's in the Berkshires. Uh, he was working at a, um, uh, 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 one of those old estates uh, mm -hmm. in horticulture, uh, working a summer job there. And so we'd go visit him and uh, I photographed many places uh, there. And um, yeah, it had that kind of, same time period, same feeling. And maybe I could even find a photograph of the gardens from that time period. Right. Uh, yeah. One of the things I love about your work, James, um, is just how quiet it is. <laughs> and it's contemplative and it's it's like a meditation. Like I feel like I'm having a, like some sort of like meditation. It's um, interesting that because that's kind of how I feel about it. I I feel like if I was a if I was a better writer. Uh, and I think Lewis Hines said something like this once where if I was a good writer, I wouldn't have to carry all this heavy equipment around. Um, it's really kind of just observing the world. And uh, I feel almost sometimes there's more of a connection to poetry uh, where it's kind of the, that kind of um, being lost in your moment, what mm -hmm. you're seeing and um, kind of illustrating it through photography. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. The other thing that I find interesting too, I mean, so so visitors to this exhibition will see these old pieces, original work, vintage photo photographs, then they'll see your work, which is the contemporary work all from the, since the 2020s, um, is how much you've produced in book format. Mm. So I'm gonna just segue for a moment to, to the books. Um, there's these beautiful books um, that you've produced um, and, and, and there's a lot of them and some of them are much bigger than this, but I, I just, this is from a quarterly that you created. And I just wanted to read a small passage. There's, it's mostly pictures. There's very little text, but this really summed I'm up. I'm not a good writer. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, but this really, you summarized your work in such a way that I was like, yeah, that's, that's what it is. So this, I'm quoting you now. It says, these images would have existed whether I had a camera with me or not. They linger in my mind's eye if the scene is not photographed. Photography, however, locks it in. It allows me to revisit the subjects, rearrange them, and share them with you. Yeah. You want to you want to uh, talk a little bit more about that locking in that you do? Yeah, I, and I think it just kind of goes back to seeing the world and then um, collecting these observations and not having a real purpose. I'm I'm not a project photographer. I'm not going to a specific location. I'm not seeking out the images. It's almost like I'm a conduit for the universe and it's coming to me and it's my job to capture what uh, comes to me and I don't miss it. Um, and if I do miss it, like I said, I, it, it it will linger in my head and I'll go, oh, I wish I had that. And now it's gone. Um, mm -hmm. And as you get older, also you start revisiting your photographs and you'll be driving around Amherst and go, oh my God, that's gone now. That that was there. And now I can go back and, and look at how something changed or, um, but yeah, it's, uh, it's more of not an intentional thing and I'm not taking them for anybody else there. It's totally a, a self um, evaluation, self project that uh, is just ongoing um, without real direction i think sometimes the the work being an archivist you, you tend to classify things and organize and so it's almost like i have this field of images that then with digital technology i can sort i can give it meta tags and i can go okay show me all the pictures of glass and then i can go oh these are really cool together and i can make a book about glass. I didn't intend to make a book about glass, but now I can I can do that and I can play with them and and start rearranging and um 
finding these um, links across time and space, things that are taken 20, 30 years across, uh, apart that are you know miles and miles away from each other, now get to live next to each other and create new mini. So mm -hmm. I really enjoy playing with those juxtapositions. Well, I, I, should, I should remind people that th these publications are for sale on your website, right? Um, we also acquired uh, four of these for the library. Um, and I, I know for the librarian, it was a, it was a, it was quite a thrill to have be the first library <laughs> to classify your books in, in the as part of the library catalog. Yeah. I think the the beauty of printing on demand. Well, there's a there's a bad side and a good side. the The bad side is this company Blurb makes a ton of money off of artists that are just making books because they like to make them. However, as a, as a photographer, you can publish your own work just for yourself. Like I like seeing them in a book format. I like holding them. I like just flipping through the pages and, and looking at them. Um, so it's, it's um, it, and I'm not making them to make money. Mm -hmm. I mean, if, if a publisher picked it up, great, that'd be awesome. But I'm, that's not my intent. It's really just, I like the book format and I like looking at them in a book and um, with with the digital technology, it's just amazing to be able to create these. Uh, I was making books in undergrad, um, working with book binders and graphic designers and, and kind of making handmade books that were really fun. But now with digital publishing, it's, it's so easy, um, mm -hmm. but it's not, it's not scalable. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Unless like you could do, um, you know, like a, a crowdfunding and, and something like that, but it's, it's a lot of work. Yeah. This is a beautiful photograph. It's just a roll of paper. <laughs> <laughs> and that's, uh, that's, that's in my basement right next to my washer. Uh, and the, the light comes through our house at different times and you see it over the seasons. And, um, and I know like this was taken in the fall because that's the only time the light comes through at that time period. Um, and, I don't know. I think it had to go to recycling and it, it ended up looking like a rose kind of. Uh -huh. uh, yeah. Yeah. It's beautiful. Um, here's another one. This is the Smith College greenhouse. So can you, I, can you tell me what impact did the pandemic have on you as a photographer? It's interesting. Uh, I think it, I think it actually helped me. Um, individually I, I it didn't really impact me for my work uh but it made me maybe focus more on my work i think my my life was going through a transition at that time anyway i was in a new job and i was just figuring things out um and photography has always been there for me to kind of occupy my time and um my experimenting and and such so i think being isolated in our house and me and the working on <laughs> photographs didn't really impact a whole lot. And and a lot of my pictures were around the house and where I am going anyway. So I don't think you would see any change other than maybe I think I produced more books during that time period because I kind of had that uh, open to me uh, to yeah. work. Well, it just is interesting because I mean, in this particular exhibition, all the work is since 2020. Yeah. It's, I mean, it's, so I thought that that was an interesting thing to know. Is right. that like, there's a lot <laughs> that you produce, unless, unless you always have produced like this. I, I, I always, yeah. I, and I think I, I, I've been slowing down more, um, but I would say, I don't know. Uh, I, if you look at my Flickr page, that's kind of where I store all of my images. Uh, and I would say it's like a hundred to 150 images a year that I'm proud of. Mm. I would uh, so we're talking thousands of images uh, that just keep accumulating. Um, and, and only a, a few of those actually make it to print. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Let's look at another one. Oh, here's, here's one that people might recognize um, because this is, again, a contemporary image. So we know the place and we know the time and we know the photographer. Um, <laughs> Symphony Hall. Um, yeah. You make it look very... Um, <laughs> the word. Very important, very important place. Symphony it's, it's interesting because, um, and that's just one of those that happened. I um, And I think I was just experimenting with this lens at that time period. Uh, this was right before the Festival of Trees, downtown Springfield. Yeah. 
and I think we could only find a parking spot there. And it was like right out of the car and I was testing my lens. And um, uh, so, yeah, and it also reminds me of, um, I think it's a band called Camper Von Beethoven has an album called New Times Roman, which has uh, the uh, this same kind of architecture and on the cover and reminded me of that album. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it's, it, I don't know, it reminds me of, of Greek architecture. Yeah. When I was in Greece, I saw a lot of things that looked like this, you yeah. know, <laughs> um, a lot. Uh, yeah, it, it definitely has that. Um, and it's beautiful. And now, so when we, when we go to the show, do you have written on the back, like Symphony Hall? You know, I really wanted to, uh, and that was part of my goal. And I tested it on a couple, but I really hate my handwriting. Uh, and it didn't look, it, I just felt like I was ruining it. Um, so I, I think in the future, I will do that. But I think only one or two actually have anything written on the back of them. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, it's interesting. This show has really... Um, it's just interesting. We were talking, you and I were talking about this, the advent of this Kodak camera and the democratization of photography where everyone suddenly was taking pictures or not suddenly, but you know, a lot more people were having the ability to take pictures with these. And especially as the price dropped, I think, cause it got down to like a buck a camera yeah. at some point. Um, right. And it's interesting to juxtapose that with today where we all have cameras. Yes. You know, if you have a cell phone, then you have a camera. <laughs> Um, you know, that there's something it's embedded in there. And so we're all doing that same thing again. Do you think our images today are going to get lost in the same way that that um, some of these images from the 1880s have? I think I think even I think even more so um, because people aren't printing. Uh, and I feel like photographs today are um, are taken for granted that uh, that we're not slowing down and there's a swipe culture. Uh, you know, I, I <laughs> left uh, social media and I, I just rejoined actually to promote the show. That's the only value I thought was like for promotion. I don't want to put my work on it because I was actually being bombarded by really good images. You know, um, it, back in the day, you would know 10, 15 photographers, you'd go to a show, you would admire their work. And now you can just scroll through hundreds of really amazing photographs. And it's a little bit depressing, I felt, you know, like, I felt like, what am I doing? Why am I doing that? What is the value of this? And and I started um, actually just being turned off by photography a little bit at the peak of social using social media. Um, and and it's addictive because you you get into like these likes and and um uh, and and that kind of thought process. Um, I'm sorry, I got off track on where I was going with this, but uh, with digital, um, I feel like, and and now with artificial intelligence, that we don't stop and really look and read a photograph any longer. And and that's something I try to teach my students is like how to uh, look at a photograph and using the um, why the picture was taken, when the picture was taken, who's in it, what was the purpose of it, how does that meaning change over time, um, and just slowing down and being in the moment and reading photography again instead of looking at it for like a split second and having a uh, like a caffeine jolt from it. Um, <laughs> so that's that's kind of my soapbox. <laughs> Uh, here's one last picture we're going to show in this presentation, um, just to remind people that we've had a camera obscura room here that I built with my students back in 2013. And it's, it is on a, on a, a bright sunny day. It is a, a very interesting viewing experience to say the least. Um, so for those people who are able to get to the to the gallery, pick a sunny day if you want to if you want to step into the into the camera obscura. But it's a reminder that this this idea of capturing light, because that's essentially all photography is, is is about your manipulation of light, right? Um, that that you can do that as you started this talk about um, not even using a camera, right? You can you're just you're just manipulating light um, and controlling light. And that's what we do in the camera obscure room, which is just off from the main from the main gallery. But um, I, I yeah, is, is there that. anything else you want to add before we before we close? 
I just want to say I love that you have that there because a, a little part of the show is also the history of photography. So I have a, a wet plate camera that my dad and his cousin uh, built based on some blueprints from the 1800s. Um, and I'll bring in some daguerreotypes and some ambrotypes and even uh, some silhouettes from pre-photography. So I absolutely love that you have the camera obscura because that goes back back to ancient Chinese uh, philosophers that were, had these, um, they called the magic treasure rooms. Um, and so I, I think it's just the yeah. perfect placement uh, to have that there. So thank you for- Yeah, and actually, and I, I also, um, uh, Aristotle, the Greek yeah. Greek, Aristotle describes the camera obscura, noting that sunlight traveling through a small opening between the leaves of a tree will create circular patches of light on the ground. And so we've we, known about this for a long, long time, right? <laughs> yeah. And when the um, the eclipse happens, it'll be really cool to look at those shadows. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, well, I have so many more questions, James. And I know as um, fellow photographers, we could talk about photography for a very long time. And we do in the classroom and we do, we'll bore anybody who comes near us and asks about photography. So, um, so I just want to um, go to our last frame here. Um, that I hope people will come and see you at the gallery because um, you're going to be there doing some demonstrations with our students and and uh, the gallery is always open um, and free to the public. So we have some special events and a reception to celebrate this most beautiful um, exhibition um, that's on view at the Springfield uh, Technical Community College um, Carberry Fine Arts Gallery. Uh, from now until April 12th. So I hope people come out and 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 see the work. Thank you so much, James. All right, thank you. All right, take care.